Hey folks, it's Michael with the CCERP podcast, E for Ecology. Part of that, of course, is plants, animals, studying them, their inner relationships, their nature, what's the nature of the animal, how does it live, how does it move and eat so it can survive and thrive in the world. Um, to do some of that, if we really want to understand, you know, um, Understanding brings appreciation. It brings wisdom. As, as what Fran, uh, Alexander Pope said, something like um, in his poem on learning or something, um, drink deep from the Pierian springs, if I pronounce that right, for there shallow draughts intoxicate the brain and drink, drinking deep sobers us again. Actually, he said, Sobers us largely or something like that, but sobers us again. Okay, so we really want to dig into things, know it. Um, if we understand things better, there wouldn't have been this big thing recently about the mountain lion um, allegedly stalking the jogger. Um, but if we understand the world or appreciate it, we can get out it, get out in it, um, know how things work. Um, understanding brings enjoyment and security and confidence. So to do some of that, we're going to look at today animals, zoology, animal tracking, using game cams to study animals. Um, and joining us is, unless I butcher the name, Janet Pesatoro. Did I say that again? Right, Janet? You said that right. That's Sweet. right. Sweet. Okay. <laughs> Could you say hi to the folks and introduce yourself? Oh, hi, everybody. So I'm Janet Pesatoro, and I am really into wildlife tracking and camera trapping, and uh, I'm honored to be interviewed on this podcast today. <laughs> Thank you. But um, could you tell folks about your background and your interests and what got you into tracking and maybe any stories from your childhood? Okay. Oh, childhood stuff. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> so we're going that far back. <laughs> right. I need to lay on the couch. Um, so I <laughs> grew up in Massachusetts um, in a somewhat densely populated blue-collar neighborhood in a family that had little interest in the outdoors. Um, <laughs> and it wasn't the happiest situation. Sorry. And so when I was little, my cat... And the plants and animals, the wild plants and animals that were in and around our yard were kind of my world, my little world cool. that gave me comfort. Nice. And I saw education as the way out of what I thought was not a great situation. So I was a very uh, studious kid once I reached high school. And um, I was always interested in the life science as any kind of organism. And I went to medical school. And I became a cool. psychiatrist, and uh, I did that for uh, maybe about 10 years. I ended up uh, mm. leaving that uh, because I had something called Meniere's syndrome, which is an inner ear disease, oh, yeah, and I yeah. also had little kids. Yeah, you're huh. familiar with that, yeah. So I had that, and I had uh, little kids to take care of, so it just became uh, too much to keep working. And I honestly did not love my job anyway, so mm. once I left, it was I never looked back to that. But in terms of, you know, wildlife, uh, while I was in medical training, um, you know, my husband and I were kind of in very demanding educational and career situations, so we didn't have a lot of free time. But on the weekends, we would, just for, for fun and to get exercise and to, you know, do something different, we would attend, like, various uh, programs that were put on by our local Audubon centers here. They have cool. all kinds of you know, birding, tracking, whatever. <laughs> and, um, you yeah, know, so I had an interest in it, but I never really had the time to put into it back then. Mm -hmm. um, and what really got me into tracking was there was one all-day program we attended. Um, this was, oh gosh, more than 30 years ago now. Uh, it was an all-day program in western Massachusetts uh, in a um, recently protected forest. That's all I remember. I remember we were the first group from the public that was allowed to set foot on this property. Hmm, wow. I wish I could remember the name of the land. I wish I could remember where it was. I wish I could remember the 
the um, instructor's name, but I can't remember any of that. But it was just a completely enchanting day. I had before that I knew nothing about wildlife tracking, and this guy just showed us stuff that it just blew me away that there was this whole other world going on there. So it, it was so complicated, so much going on among the animals outdoors. It was in the winter, so it was snow tracking. Cool. And it was a really just spectacular, beautiful day. So we just had a wonderful day, and I always, you know, when people ask me, like, what was the best day of your life, I often say that day. <laughs> <laughs> it was just so yeah. much fun. Makes sense. And, um, and then, you know, I, by, by that time, I really wanted to spend more time on learning about wildlife, but I was still, um, I, think I, I think that was while I was in my residency, medical, medical residency program. Hmm. Um, somewhat time around there, so I just didn't have a lot of time. But then when I uh, stopped working and was full-time home with my kids, um, I had to find you know, things to do with the kids that would be interesting and fun and get them outside and also interesting to me. So the kinds of things we did were tracking and birding and you know various wildlife outdoor-related things. And so I kind of sneakily pursued my own interests while I was also kind of entertaining them and you know <laughs> nice. so that's how that was so cool. <clears throat> but um what kind of things did you do did the kids enjoy it like what kind of any like uh, memorable yeah, experiences so like one of the things we, one of the things we did was we set up a bluebird nesting box trail we um my husband built like I think it was like 30 nest boxes, and we all went out and set them up, and then the kids would monitor them with me. Um, so we did that, and I started like a kids' nature club, and which kind of revolved around that, you know, checking the nest boxes and, and other things too. We did other kinds of outings. Um, and then um, when my daughter was nine, she's the oldest, when she was nine, um, we did this um, with this wildlife tracking program with Sue Morris in Vermont. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but she used to, I think she's just recently retired. She used to train community groups to learn to identify track and sign so that they could provide uh, data, like wildlife presence absence data to local um, conservation organizations. Hmm. So I got together a local group, of, local group of adults, and my daughter was allowed to come with us uh, she was like the only child to ever have been on this program. Mm, cool. So the two of us went and, um, went and did that with, al along with our local group. And that was the first time I really, uh, you know, kind of delved into tracking in particular. And since then, I've been a fanatic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That was around, that was around, I think that was like 2005 that we did that program. And since then, it's like I've been completely obsessed. Cool. Um, what kind of animals did you identify in that so it was in the northeast here so we learned um to recognize track and sign of all the local species which were um deer moose bears uh bobcats fishers um foxes coyotes and then you know the less charismatic animals the small ones like uh various squirrels and mice and you know small mammals um that kind of stuff mm -hmm. uh, but they were she was Sue Morse focused mostly on um, the larger animals because those are the animals that are sort of umbrella species for us here in the Northeast um, like um, because we were supposed to be providing data for conservation organizations um, they would want to know the, they're more interested in the presence of the larger species because if the larger species are present then you know that there's sufficient habitat for them. If there's sufficient habitat for large species, then under that umbrella, um, lots of other smaller species also have mm -hmm. uh, adequate habitat. Makes sense. Um, so that's, that was kind of the focus of, of that uh, experience. And that was mainly on identifying the sign and not trailing or anything like that? No, it wasn't trailing. It was just <laughs> identifying track and sign. She had a spe Sue had a specific protocol that she wanted the her trainees to, to use. We actually never <laughs> used that protocol uh, because it wasn't uh, the, the the land trust that we provided data for weren't uh, particularly interested in that. So we just did what was useful to them. And, uh, and we didn't provide, you know, we were first and foremost, we were more of a recreational tracking group. group. We all love to, to track for fun. Uh, but, you know, just to feel like we had a purpose, we sometimes provided uh, data for um, local land trusts, you know, when when requested. Mm -hmm. So that's how that was. 
Cool. Um, um, and then um, for now, do you do mostly um, camera capture or animal tracking or both? Well, both because the tracking is really what informs where you put the camera to get interesting stuff. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's. I know there are people who don't really know how to track, and they put just cameras in random spots yeah. or on you know animal trails. They know how to identify an animal trail. You could do it that way, but when you if you really get into it and you really want to use your cameras to um, just get interesting behaviors on video or answer whatever questions you might have about their behavior, or just get really you know cool photos and cool videos, um, the more you know about tracking. And you know, recognizing animal sign, then the the much better you'll be at placing your cameras to get um, interesting things. Like for example, um, if you know what if if you know what a game trail looks like, you can just put your camera there, and you can get deer and coyotes and foxes walking by, and maybe a bobcat. Um, so you get animals walking by. But if you wanted to say um, look at the scent marking behavior of bears, you're going to know have to know how to recognize what a bear um, marking tree looks like, or a bear marking trail looks like, and you'll have to find, you know, find those elements. Um, so the more you know about tracking, the better your camera trap. So the, for me, the camera trapping kind of grew out of tracking, and it was a really cool way to finally get to see what I could only imagine hmm. through tracking. Hmm. So yeah. when you track, you look for tracks and sign, and you're kind of imagining in your in your mind's eye what this animal is doing, how it's behaving. But with the cameras, you get to see it, which was just blew my mind away. Really. Yeah, the secret like, life. wow, it's real. But yeah, so it's like with a lot of people can recognize like a road. Look, there's a highway. Oh, look, yeah. there's maybe an animal trail. It doesn't take yeah. much real understanding or depth. Um, not to knock it, you know, it's like a good yeah. thing. Yeah. But just to point out the use that as a contrast or a foil for what you're doing, um, you've got to know the nature of the animal and a little bit about the ecology just as Tom Brown and some others say um, Tom Brown anyway um, Tom Brown Jr. um, Mm -hmm. how do you put it Uh, an animal is an instrument played by its environment Um, so you got to know about the environment and how it's played by the animal the interrelationship know what's possible um so tracking is not merely some, like the way you're doing it, tracking and trailing. It's into getting into, not just identifying a picture, um, like when right. we're young, cow, um, goat. <laughs> it's like yes, exactly. And for some of, people, tracking is like that, and that's totally fine. Yeah, fine. But yeah. I was always driven by I want to understand more. I want to know more about the animal. I not want to know how it interacts with it, its environment. I want to see what it's doing. Um, so I do you know, take it a lot further than just, you know, recognizing the track and sign. And it's true that the more you already know about the animal, the more you will learn from hmm. uh, tracking and camera trapping because yeah. you'll, you'll know where to look. You'll know, you'll think of further questions to ask. So it can go deeper and deeper and deeper. It kind of never ends, which is cool. It's a, there are hobbies that can, that never get boring. I think for that reason, there are so many layers of complexity and always so much more to know. And, and a lot of it, frankly, what I love particularly about camera trapping is, so much about these animals is unknown to science and true any person with a cheap trail camera <laughs> yeah. can kind of be doing cutting edge research if you're just curious and persistent you know because you're you're getting to see what animals do and that's not all known yet we don't all know all of that yet there's still a lot of unanswered questions or just like i think that's, on iNaturalist there's some common folk so-called that maybe discover new species or find a species that was thought to not have been in, in an area for a long time. Yeah. Yeah. Or, and find a new behavior, find oh, yeah. a new type of scent marking behavior, which is something that I've found a few times. Something that, cool. uh, a couple of things that I've never found in any books or tracking books or anything. Cool. So that was pretty cool. Um, now, are you like, do you have any certification in tracking or camera work or what? Do I, do I have certification? Is yeah. that what you said? Yeah. Uh, yeah. For um, for tracking, I um, I am Cyber Tracker certified. I forget all their different categories. I think it's uh, Track and Sign Level Three. Cool. As far as I know, for camera trapping, there isn't any certification system. 
uh, not yet. Do it. Are you writing the book on it? <laughs> well, not certification. No, I'm kind of not into that. I, I, <laughs> my book is more on uh, teaching people uh, ex- exactly what we were just talking about. Um, hmm. The basics you need to know about the animals track and sign and behavior so that you can go out and find good places to put your camera and to sort of stimulate um, people to think about what questions they could ask, um, you know, about whatever species they're, they're interested in. How many pages is your book? 306 pages. Cool. Did you ever think you'd write something like that? (laughs) No, uh, you know, it's a funny story. So, um, (laughs) when I started tracking, when we did, we started the Sue Morse programs back in 2005, um, I was taking photos obsessively of every, you know, every nice track and all interesting animal sign that we found. And for years, my friends were joking with me, um, you know, saying, you know, assuming that I was some gu- sometime going to write some kind of tracking related book, you know, they, they would say, you know, when you write your book, or is that going to go in your book? And I said, what are you talking about? I'm not going <laughs> to write a book. I'm not even thinking about it. Huh. I'm not doing but then it got to the point where I had accumulated such a large library of photos <laughs> and you know some of them were pretty decent quality I thought well well why not and the focus on camera trapping the reason for that was that when I got my first trail camera that was I was kind of in my beginning stages of tracking so I didn't hmm. um I didn't know a lot about the different species and I wasn't that great at identifying track and sign yet and so I didn't, it wasn't obvious to me how to determine where to put the camera. So, of course, what I did is I, um, I searched for books on it, thinking that, well, somebody must have written a book on this already. Trail cameras <laughs> have been around for a long time, so somebody mm-hmm. must have written a, a book. Like, I was, I was envisioning a field guide, you know, going species by species that would tell me uh, how to uh, find good camera placements. And I was really surprised. There is no book like that. There's hmm. no book like that. Wow. Can you believe it? So <laughs> no. over time, I accumulated what one needed to write such a book. So essentially what I did is I wrote the book that I wanted to read years ago, <laughs> yeah. but that didn't cool. exist. Yeah. Hmm. Is it only hard copy, audible, or like what? Um, it's it's available in paperback and on Kindle uh, oh, cool. on Amazon. Um, how's it sectioned and chaptered? So there's, I have to flip back myself to see, remember how I did this. <laughs> there is an, uh, an, an introductory um, part where I talk about um, things like the basics of trail cameras and the basics of tracks, track measurement, and, and that kind of thing. And then the rest of it is organized species by species. Hmm. So, you know, there's a bobcat chapter, there's a coyote chapter, there's a bear chapter, a moose chapter, and so forth. And it covers um, almost 40 species. Hmm, cool. And I just, it's kind of, you know, laid out like a field guide, you know, with, with range maps and a picture of the animal. And, um, and then I go into, you know, the tracks and trail patterns, diet and scent marking and things like that and habitat, breeding behavior. And then for each species, I have a couple pages that's, uh, that's called camera trapping tips, where I kind of... Um, make sense of all those facts and put it together into a story and give some advice as to what to look for and when to look for it, you know, what season of the year to look for it to get interesting behaviors. And for people that are really ambitious, I also, uh, for a lot of the species, I talk about either rarely observed or poorly understood behaviors so that they can go look for those things and kind of really be doing cutting edge research. Cause that for me, that's what it's kind of about is empowering anybody who's curious and, um, and persistent, uh, who just wants to learn stuff to, to do real research, to do, to learn, you know, really learn new stuff, discover new stuff. Cool. Um, so it's about six to eight pages per animal. Uh, that sounds about right. Yeah. yeah. Um, all mammals? Is it any birds, like barred owl or anything? I have a few birds, and the uh, let's see, I have five birds. I have wild turkeys, the ruffed grouse, the great blue herring, heron, uh, ruby-throated hummingbird, and the pileated woodpecker. Oh, cool. And the reason I chose those... Is it pileated was, or pileated? Oh, I, every time I say it one way, somebody <laughs> corrects me and tells me it's the other way, so I don't know which way. Huh. 
I say pileated, but I've never looked it up. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, I've loved, some people say that, but when I've said that, I've just been told, oh, it's pileated. So whatever. <laughs> it's fine with me. Um, uh, so I chose for the birds, I chose birds that spend time low enough to the ground so that people don't need to climb 30 feet up in a tree to put the camera to But, of course, you could do that if you wanted to. Mm-hmm. Um, you could You could monitor bird activity by putting... Uh, you know, cameras facing tree cavities high in a tree or just up in a tree in general, just in case a bird builds its nest near there. But, um, but yeah, I, I, I tried to make it, I tried to choose species that would be, that most people would uh, want to and would be able to camera trap. Mm-hmm. Uh, and also there's, you know, I know a lot of hunters have trail cameras, so I try to include the game species like turkey and grouse as well as the game mammals that they are interested in. Um, so, you know, I had limited pages to deal with. I wasn't supposed to go much over 300 pages, and I just picked the species mm-hmm. that I thought would be of most interest to the kind of people that would be interested in such a book. Yeah. So what are some of the things that are in, the, like, the bobcat chapter? Bobcat. So, of course, I go through its tracks and sign, and... Well, I'd have to reread my own chapter to know exactly. <laughs> yeah. But in terms of in terms of you know how to find the bobcat, so um, uh, you want to for when you're dealing with a predator, one of the things. Well, well let me back up. For any large, you know, medium to large animal, many of them will use game trails. So there's always that option, just choosing game trails. And if you can recognize their tracks and scat, all the better, because then you can determine. Oh, not only is this a game trail, but a bobcat is using it. So that's one option. But other things to think about is where is their food? They go to where the food is. So one of their favorite foods, it, hmm. in, certainly in my part of the country, is rabbits, either cottontails or snowshoe hares. So wherever cool. you see a high density of their favorite foods, um, uh, snowshoe hares and cottontails, there's a good bet that a cat will come prowling through there. So you want to kind of investigate those areas in decent tracking conditions if you can. And, and see if you have any bobcat tracks. And once you determine that a cat's in the area, um, just putting it near its uh, near its favorite food is is a pretty good strategy. Hmm. Um, if you find, you know, uh, I don't know how technical you want to get into the tracking, but if you can find a scat with a scrape, and that that means it's a scent marking area, cats sometimes return to those. So you just target the scrape, and you're uh, there's a high likelihood of of getting the cat doing that. Um, then they also like uh, the, the kind of habitat they like um, is uh, like uh, dense, dense brush, um, and uh, and that's where the rabbits are too. And they also like uh, cliffy areas, caves, that kind of thing, uh, because they use those caves as dens and as resting places. And they're also hunting the mice and other small animals that kind of hide in the crevices. So they're very attracted to to those areas. And and the other thing that almost everything. In, in my part of the country, likes is um, is beaver wetlands and bobcats spend a lot of time hunting around the edges of beaver wetlands just because there's a very high prey density there, hmm. and they also are very likely to use beaver dams as bridges to, to as an easy way to cross the water. Yeah, they don't go uh, after beaver do though, that? right? Um, they would go after beaver kits, and they hmm. might go after. Um, a, 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 an adult beaver if they have a, a really good opportunity, but it's unlikely that they're going to get up in, in, in the morning and say, I'm going beaver hunting because that's, <laughs> yeah. like that's not their main prey. But if they're out near a beaver wetland and they happen to have a really good opportunity to catch one off guard or there's one that's injured or sick or whatever, of course, they will go for mm-hmm. it. Um, they, they catch uh, muskrats around here are, are in beaver wetlands and uh, bobcats catch those. Um, so there's a lot of prey, and there's even you know rodents sometimes living in the nooks and crannies of mm-hmm. beaver um, uh, dams and lodges, and bobcats will hunt there. Um, they'll even um, kind of sometimes sit on top of beaver lodges and use it as kind of a lookout, an elevated spot to look cool. out of, and they'll scent mm-hmm. mark on top of those. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of opportunity around beaver wetlands for for bobcats. And you were talking uh, about using the um, dams to cross. Yes, uh, yeah. What I tell people who are just getting into trail cameras, if you don't know much about tracking le- yet, but you have beavers in your area, a really good place to put the camera is uh, to face a beaver dam. Just target a beaver dam because you get like, it's 
a really good bang for the buck. It's almost immediate gratification because hmm. not only bobcats, a lot of animals use those dams as bridges, cool. and other animals are attracted to the dams for other reasons. Like, for example, the beaver itself is going to be working on its dam if it's an active uh, active beaver pond. Uh, otters will often haul out right near beaver dams, and they hunt for fish right around beaver dams. Hmm. So they're kind of uh, hot, little, little biodiversity hot spots. And a great place to start if you just want to get something on your camera and you're not, um, you're not a, a great tracker yet. Start there, and that's that. That it, that's likely to get people hooked because once you see what you can get there, they're oh, I want to keep doing this. I need another camera. <laughs> they get they get obsessed with it. Hmm, cool. Yeah. Um, so, what what are maybe the top three, top five um, foods animals prey for the bobcat? They really vary. Bobcats. Um, someone wrote a book on bobcats called Bobcat Mas- Bobcat Colon Master of Survival. And the point of the book is that bobcats are so incredibly adaptable, um, and, and that's the key to their survival. And part of that adaptability is they'll eat almost anything, from insects to reptiles, amphibians, small mammals, uh, medium-sized mammals. And they're even, you know, at, at certain times and in certain places, they can even focus on deer. That's not a. Co- I don't want to say this and have people walk away thinking, oh, bobcats, you know, hunt deer on a regular basis. That's not the way it is. But there is the occasional study that shows them uh, that in certain places they do focus mostly on deer. So they can hunt anything. Um, overall, if you looked out across, you know, the country, probably the most common things are rabbit species. Um, in the West, uh, wood rat species, kangaroo rats, um, uh, squirrels, tree squirrels here, they, they hunt mice, of course. So on average, it's those small mammals. Mm-hmm. So they're but important. They'll, they'll get. They'll even hunt snakes. I mean, they'll hunt anything. Hmm. They're very, very adaptable. But important for our ecology to keep it safe for humans. Good for human ecology. Keep the rodents under control. Rodents spreading yeah. disease a lot. Absolutely, absolutely. So they they perform their perform their service. That's uh, useful to us. Yeah, snakes, owls, hawks, bobcats, coyotes. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot more important to human health than a lot of people realize, I think, but just because yes. the way education is, what people know, what they don't. Um, but cool. Yeah. No, I think I think people have kind of lost touch with that. You know, those are things that people would have realized when we were hunter-gatherers or even when we were subsistence farmers because, you know, our dependence on nature was, was obvious. It was sort of an everyday thing, but most of us, and, you know, don't really interact with nature that much. We just kind of live in parallel with it, and we don't really think of those connections. So it's important to remind people to, of that. And then I think, yeah, without that knowledge, people maybe studying history don't get what might be why some ancient people worshipped some creature. You know, it wasn't yeah. until I got into really studying more biology and ecology and stuff, I thought... um knowing the role of snakes, it's like, hmm, I wonder if since some people in South America worship the snake, like how much was mm-hmm. strength, how much was it maybe at one time in their history, some of them were scared and killed a bunch of snakes, and then there were more rats, and so they might think like the snake god brought a plague of rats upon us spreading disease because of what we did. So we need to worship. The oh, snake. interesting. I wonder oh, if there's anything yeah. like that. It's like, and unfortunately we have no way of knowing that I'm aware of. It's just yeah. lost to history, but things like that seem to me would have been part of why they might've worshiped the coyote or the snake or whatever. Um, sure. Yeah. You know, because that's yeah. part of it. Like just as um, people would look at like, some primitive so-called primitive people, some things in religions or in the Bible, like you got the thing about God will spite your children and your children's children, you know, or the sins of the father will be passed upon the kids. And it's like, ha, whatever. That's so stupid. But now it's like, whoa, with epigenetics it's like, that's in a way that's actually right. It's like, yeah, there's epigenetic influences that go down like three to six generations. Yeah. So yeah. it's like, whoa, that puts it in a whole different light, you know? Yeah. Um, interesting, interesting stuff like that going yeah. on. Yeah. Super but, interesting. Yeah. yeah. But um, so 
have you um, anything more to add about what you like about tracking or game cams? I think we might have addressed that uh, question a little bit, but anything more? Yeah, um, uh, hmm. yeah, I can't really think of any yeah. <laughs> anything to add to that. Maybe what, I will as we go along. But, and uh, what about um, we head down here? Some of the questions I'm looking at. We had, um, are you certified in tracking and camera work? And then, like, what's all involved in the certification or in the tracking and the camera work? Anything else you want to add on that? Um, well, uh, the cyber tracker stuff, I, I don't know how familiar your audience is. Have, have you taken cyber tracker? Not yet. Or? I need to. <laughs> People are oh, making yeah, me feel yeah. bad. I talked to. Yeah, so. <laughs> oh, now I've talked to uh, a local, um, Bo Harger, recently. And you know, he's like level three and you're yeah. making me feel bad and jealous and envious and wanting to do it and curious and all these good things. And he was too. And yeah, it's like, um, I can be kind of lazy. I need to do that though. Sounds so interesting being around people like that. Yeah. Yeah. So some people really love those. And in fact, they kind of get obsessed with cyber tracker and they take, um, exam after exam after exam. I, I wasn't one of those people. I just wanted my certification because I wanted to teach tracking. I, I lead, or well, actually because of the pandemic, I'm not doing it now, but um, in the past years I was leading um, cool. uh, tracking programs and, uh, uh, and I, I just wanted some kind of credential for that. So I did the, I took a t cyber tracker exam and um, the way it was, was um, it was two days out in the field uh, where the examiner would find various, you know, tracks or other kind of sign, and it can be absolutely anything. It doesn't have to be mammal sign. It could be bird sign, sometimes insect sign, and uh, you would have to identify it. Or he would ask you some other, he might, it might be identification, or he might ask you some other question about it. And, uh, and that's what it was, and then they tally it up at the end and, and give you a score. But it's also very educational because they will teach you a lot as you go through. So yeah. um, they nice. tell you, you know, for each one you do, it's not like you wait till the very end to find out the answers. They tell you, like, everybody writes down their answer for certain, you know, for whatever the test question is. And then after everybody's put down their answer, um, they discuss it with you. They tell you what it is and they discuss cool. it and why it's, why it's this and not other things. So it, it is really good and uh, uh it's a it's a good way of learning for me. It's not my favorite way of learning, but um, it you know I do highly recommend it. I don't have anything negative to say about it. I just for some reason didn't get hooked into that the way um, I know a lot of people do get really really mm -hmm. um, you know into the cyber tracker stuff. Mike, um, what do you mean? I'm more like I I'm more inclined to just want to pursue whatever I'm interested in at the time <laughs> rather yeah. than have a an examiner, you know, be teaching me this, you know, picking out the test questions and teaching me this stuff. I just like to go out and do it. <laughs> and, and, uh, and I, you know, I often kind of have, you know, in my head, I have goals set about what I'm going to learn. Like this last summer, um, I really wanted to uh, improve my bear tracking skills. So I focused a lot on that. And I spent a lot of time uh, tracking bears and just cool. learning a lot more about the summer tracking sign. And one of the reasons I did that is that um, so up here in the north, I live in Massachusetts, and uh, because snow is such a great substrate, um, most people, including myself, when they track up here, only snow track. Hmm. And, but that limits you to what happens in the winter, and animals have different behaviors in different seasons, and bears in particular are asleep in the winter, so you don't get to do too much bear tracking in the winter up here. But I really wanted to learn about bears, so I had to um, do that in the summer, and that, that's what... I primarily focused on this past summer and just learned a tremendous amount on my own. And to me, that's this sort of self-directed learning where I, I pick my own goals and I just, you know, pursue it to whatever degree I want to is my favorite way of learning. But um, for those who like something more structured and, you know, I'm kind of a loner, you know, <laughs> yeah. my, my husband and I go out and do track. Sometimes I track alone. I track with him. I track with a couple of friends, but I'm not like a, a big group type of person. Um, but if you like that, if you want the, um, you know, the, the, the social milieu of a, of a group of, you know, 10 or 12 people, whatever they have at those exams, and, and you like having the examiner, you know, teach you then and there, then that's a really good way to learn. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's one good thing about tracking. Um, 
however you do it, um, a common principle, a common fact is that you got to be independent and you got to like deal with reality. Unlike too much education influenced by Plato um, and some other bad philosophers <clears throat> is to um, words divorced from reality, words with no meaning. Um, hence, it's a cliche. When are we ever going to use this? Stuff like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. If um, it's not so much the content, like some people say they hate math or whatever. Um, it's not the math. I think it's a problem. It's like how it's taught. But distinguishing yeah, they those... might not see they might not see any relevance to them yet, you know. Yeah. But if mm-hmm. it's a, if it's a pre, if you give them um, if you put it in the context of something meaningful and practical to them, they might be interested in it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's one thing I think. Like some Plato and some others are missing about knowledge. It's not just some, and then the ancient Greeks in general, we had to learn. It's not their fault. It's where they were in history, but people had to learn that, um, knowledge is a value component. It's a tool of survival. Um, getting that into education, that basic principle, I think would help it a lot. Oh, I totally agree with you. I didn't see it that way when I was younger and my kids were little, I wish I had, uh, but either, uh, but yeah. I totally agree with you that that's the way. That's the better way to learn is to um, allow them to kind of set their own goals and study whatever they're interested in at the time, whatever you know is meaningful to them at the time, and they'll they'll learn it all. You know, they'll learn what they need to learn. We don't need to be, um, you know, shoving facts down their throats. <laughs> yeah, it's got to be a little of both. They need the guidance. Yeah, a little they need of the both. motivation. I mean, yeah. 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 Cause I know that's one thing I see in a lot of people, um, you know, like students I work with, there's, yeah, there's no way in hell they're going to know what's out there or what's available or what I could help them with because they don't know. I used to not either. <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah, we don't know how things are connected or where something's going to lead. Um, on our own, we need someone wiser to point that out for us. That's part of yeah. being human, I think. Yeah, sure. But sure. Um, what are some of your favorite animals to track? Does it change? Yeah, it changes. I don't really have favorite animals. I tend to, um, like I was just saying, you know, the bears, I wanted to understand them better, their summer behavior better. So I spent a lot of time on them. And so for this past summer, they were my favorite. And then I <laughs> then I switched to moose became my favorite as the summer drew to a close because I... Hmm wanted to observe moose rutting behavior and now that the rutting season is coming to a close i'm getting uh, more going to focus more on fisher because i have this goal that mm. i want to um, learn more about fisher scent marking and i want to find some of their scent posts and set cameras at them in the winter because some things i'm wondering about about with that so that's how i tend to do it i just kind of have my you know obsession of the season <laughs> and, I, I, think and that- I focus on on that animal for a particular time. And, uh, and then there's, you know, I know that there are certain behaviors like that, uh, like the otter, um, uh, is active at its discrete latrines in both the fall and the spring. So I tend to set up cameras, um, hmm. at otter latrines in spring and fall, but they're, they don't do that as much in the winter and summer. So I don't focus on them as well, you know, so it's whatever it, it changes over time with me. I, um, mm-hmm. I have a real hankering to go travel more out west so I can learn more about species that we don't have here. Mm-hmm. I, in fact, I had plans to, to do that this year until the pandemic hit. So, um, you know, I'm just really spending most of my time here in Massachusetts. But I really, really want to learn more about species that we don't have here, like wolves and cougars and badgers and prairie dogs and you name it. You know, so many species that are out there that we don't have here. Um, yeah. So you mentioned bear and moose, but can you tell folks what Fisher is? People not, might not know that one. Everyone um, knows bear. Yeah. Everyone knows moose, but Fisher? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, you guys wouldn't know that down uh, – you're in Texas, right? Yeah. Yeah. You wouldn't know that in the south because it's only – it ranges only in the, the far north. Mm-hmm. Um, it is a like a big weasel. <laughs> it's a member of the weasel family, and it weighs usually in the 10 to 15-pound range – it's um it tends to be fairly uniformly black to dark brown uh with some grizzling on the shoulders uh it's a predator has a really long tail so it's a and being in the weasel family has a very long body and short legs so that's the appearance and 
It uh, it favors uh, forested forested habitats, especially if there are a lot of mature trees um, and uh, and dead and dying trees with with cavities in them, because it uses those cavities for breeding. And because it's a 10 to 15 pound animal, it needs a large cavity, and therefore it needs large trees um, hmm. in in its forest. It also likes forests where there are lots of fallen logs, because uh, in the wintertime, it also uses resting spots under logs, and it also likes to hunt the various rodents that hide uh, in and among logs. So that's the kind of habitat it likes. It's pretty well adapted for for snowy conditions. It has, for its body size, it has fairly large feet so that it doesn't sink much in the snow, and it has a nice bushy fur to keep warm. So it's, it's pretty much a, a northern uh, creature. What does it include in its diet? A um, lot of overlap with the bobcat. Hmm. Um, rabbits, squirrels, mice. Um, it's one of the few species, however, that is very effective at hunting porcupines, which we have a lot of around here. Hmm. Um, yeah, the porcupine is well defended by its quills, but the fisher has a couple of different methods it uses that other animals um uh, aren't as as good at so um, what it does is so the porcupine if it's able to it will it tends to uh, climb a tree when it's scared uh, well that's one of the things it does if there's if there's no other place to hide it will climb a tree and then a fisher can continue chasing it so the porcupine is forced to go further and further out on the limbs uh, and sometimes they uh, they fall out of the tree and get injured and then the fisher can kill them that way they also, fishers will, if the porcupine's on the ground, the fisher will uh, kind of circle around it and try to um, try to uh, injure its face. Hmm. Uh, the porcupine, because it's got a lot of quills in the tail and the back, it keeps trying to spin around and face its back end to the fisher. But the fisher keeps um, chasing uh, its face, and, um, and the porcupine can eventually uh, bleed to death because of what the fisher's uh, done to its face hmm. and uh, and then it flips it over and uh, and opens it in the stomach where there are no quills hmm. uh, so they are fairly regular predators of porcupines um, hmm. they, they, and and not so likely to uh, to suffer uh, from the quills because they have an effective way of killing the porcupine hmm. and what are some other um, types of weasels besides the fish Oh, so um, let's see. So we have here we have two of the smaller weasel species. We have um, long-tailed and short-tailed weasels. In other parts of North America, there's something called a least weasel. And in other parts of the north that's not too far from us, like in the Adirondacks of New York and in Maine, they have something called a marten, which is mm -hmm. uh, similar to a fisher but smaller, much smaller. Um, and it's also really, really adapted, even better adapted for deep snow conditions than the fisher. And it's more arboreal, spends more of its time in trees than, than fishers do. But hunts a lot of the same animals, um, you know, small mammals, squirrels, mice, um, rabbits. And in the west, um, there's the badger, which is in the weasel family, although it looks a little bit different. It doesn't have the, it doesn't, doesn't look so long and skinny. Um, but that's, um, that's an animal of open habitats, fields, um, desert, uh, sagebrush desert, and they are expert diggers. They dig their dens in the ground, and they also, um, their favorite things to hunt are burrowing mammals, so they um, will dig for them, like they'll dig up prairie dogs, ground squirrels, kangaroo rats, um, and, uh, and, and eat them, and sometimes they... Basically, they're they're hunting and digging their den at the same time. They dig up these burrowing mammals, and when they mm. after they eat them, they they just live in the hole. They they sleep in the hole as their den. Um, so they're they're super interesting. Multitasking. Super interesting animals, mm. huh? Multitasking. Multitasking. Yeah, yeah, Very efficient. yeah. So I'd love to spend more time learning about them out west. Huh, yeah. If, uh, if I could get there. How much does a porcupine weigh? Mm. Probably on average, an adult is. Probably around ten pounds, but they can mm. get a lot bigger than that. Mm -hmm. That's just, just a guess. I'd have to look up exactly, but yeah, they're they're not huge. 
mm-hmm. smaller than beavers, but I believe they're the second biggest rodent in North America. Hmm. And what did you learn about bears when you were studying them? So, let's see. What did I learn about bears? I learned more. So I already, you, you're probably familiar with, do you have bears where you are? I think, thank goodness, some are making a comeback. I think black bear starting to return um, maybe south of here in some places. And I think uh, east and maybe west a little bit. Um, need to improve that, but uh, I think they're making a comeback a little bit. Yeah, pretty cool. Yeah. So um, so bears have these, uh, they what we call marking trees, where they um, typically in spring and summer, they go to these trees and they bite them, claw them, and rub them. And it's it's pretty entertaining to watch on video what they do. And I knew what those looked like. So it's not like. just in Disney movies? <laughs> it's not just in Disney movies. That's just blue. <laughs> <laughs> but that is sort of realistic. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and what I didn't really know that much about was, well, first of all, I didn't, I never realized how common those trees were. I wasn't very good at identifying them. I got a lot um, more aware of those this summer because I was also trying to look for what's called uh, bear stomp trails. There's a number of names for those. There's stomp hmm. trail, ritual trail, and marking trail, and mark trail, all mean the same thing. And those are trails where the bears, for whatever reason, um, step in the same spots all the time when they when they walk up and down those trails so that what it it creates this pattern of worn out depressions that are kind of in an alternating pattern in the way that they walk so so i know you know what this is but just for listeners if they're not that familiar i'm not sure if this is clear so i just want to make sure i'm describing this accurately so what I'm saying is each time a bear, regardless if it's a big bear or a little bear, they step in the same spots when they go down that trail. They put their feet in the same spots so that you see these worn-out ovals where their footfalls are. Uh, and it's in a zigzag pattern because that's the pattern that their tracks create when they when they walk. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's actually really cool to see. Um, if it's if it's on, like, brown substrate, like, like dirt or uh, pine needles or something like that, um, they're hard to see because they're, the, they're, these worn-out areas are simply brown depressions. They're the same Hmm. color as a substrate. But if it's in like a mossy substrate or some kind of low ground cover, some kind of green, you know, green vegetation that's low growing like that, the worn areas are brown and they're surrounded by the green. So you literally see this uh, pattern of brown ovals, Hmm. um, zigzag of brown ovals in the the green. And it's, it's, uh, it's really kind of cool to find it. And I, I used to think because I hadn't really done much bear tracking in summer, I used to think these things were rare. I never noticed them. And now I realize Having spent so much time in the summer, I realized how common they are. I'm finding them everywhere. You know, everywhere there are bears. And uh, mm-hmm. and the reason I never saw them in the fall is as soon as the leaves fall here, they cover everything up, mm-hmm. so you wouldn't see those depressions. And, of course, in the wintertime, the bears are asleep. So um, I just couldn't believe it. I thought these were kind of rare, these, you know, not very common, commonly seen things. But I have found them now, I don't know, at least six or seven different places um, cool. around here. So that's been cool, and I and using the cameras, I learned that the what the when the bears use those trails, um, it's kind of. Oh, I should mention for people that when they do that, this behavior is thought to be a form of scent marking. They're marking the ground with scent from the bottoms of their feet, hmm. and they use kind of a funny gait. They sometimes kind of stomp into those worn Hmm. ovals Hmm. or kind of rub their feet into them as they walk so their gait looks different Hmm. and uh, what i didn't realize until i started putting cameras up is um that it's kind of a whole uh complex behavior kind of ritual that they do where they they rub or but they do the tree thing they rub and bite and claw at the tree and then they'll go walk up and down the stomp trail using that funny gait uh, and sometimes there's other forms of scent marking going on there too. Like if there's a little pool of water, they might go for a dip in the pool of water and rub their head against the the bank of the pool, and that's you know additional scent marking. And they might do these things repetitively. So it's just been really cool. Like it opened up a whole new world to see it on video and to realize that um, these just aren't like separate little things that they're doing. You know, the tree and the and the trail and rubbing the head on the on the bank of the pool. It's like a 
it's like a, a whole sequence. It's, I guess, like the way I think of it is as like each one separately is like a word, and the whole thing together is a paragraph. Hmm. Part of like the whole, whole complex, yeah, whole, complex communication. That, whole single you know, ritual. We don't understand it. Yeah, whole ritual. It's it's which is pretty cool. I mean, I don't know. But yeah, that, I was, think that was what my. Go ahead. What? Fortunately, we're learning. Some people are learning more of that nowadays. Unfortunately, it wasn't longer ago, but more about animal consciousness, animal communication. And I guess part of it comes about from people with some bad, illogical, wrong ideas like uh, Descartes, I think the Stoics, um, not thinking that animals didn't have a consciousness or like Descartes. Or B.F. Skinner, they were merely machines. Or Skinner, consciousness didn't matter. Um, yeah. I haven't looked into the Stoics. I'm not sure exactly to what extent they believe that. Um, but there's influences in the culture from that that have really impaired Western history. Every culture has good things and bad things. And um, is even with us today, yeah. some of the bad stuff. But thankfully, yeah, there's um, more being learned about um, how some crows have funerals, elephants have funerals, and can mm -hmm. kind of get the idea of a burial site. Um, chimpanzees can engage in complex behaviors and thinking so they can hunt monkeys. You can have a team of yeah. like five or six or more um, mm -hmm. deciding ahead of time what they're going to do. Yeah. Having roles yeah. and going after the monkeys and catching them and being able to adapt to changes and things. Um, yeah. A lot more of that going on. So, yeah, it's like, um, unfortunately, there's still some of the idea that animals are stupid. Um, we're yeah, humans. We're is, so smart. It's kind of a. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, okay. Some people are smart if we realize our whole human nature and be that way. But being human as such doesn't make you better than other animals. We got to actualize our nature not just let it kind of be their potential like mush but um we have the potential to do a lot but we also have the potential to be worse since we have free will um animals are true to their yeah. nature some people can be less than the nature abominations of nature and human history unfortunately shows that but um yeah. it's nice seeing how it's interesting yeah the um some of these behaviors as you say people might have thought are in isolation how there's actually this whole longer ritual all this stuff is actually yeah. connected with the black bear that's interesting yeah fascinating yeah I, it's just related to what you say i always found it fascinating that in science when we're, we're when people do animal studies in science it the burden of proof is on those who who say that animals do have some emotion or do have this or that ability to reason uh, rather than those who say that they mm -hmm. don't, which is, it's interesting. You have to start somewhere, right? It's not, it's not like there's nothing inherently correct about saying, well, we have to start with the assumption that animals can't do any of these things and yeah. show that they do. Um, it would be just as reasonable to say we should start with the assumption that they can't, that they do have these emotions, they can feel happy, they can solve problems. The reason I think it would be just as reasonable to start that way is that we evolved from animals. We have common ancestors, and it's not likely that um, humans are inherently different and just kind of, you know, came from nothing. It's much more likely that you know, we, have a, we have a lot of genes in common with other animals, so it's much more likely that they um, they have the genes for similar behaviors and and abilities. You know, I don't know if I'm wording this well. Hmm. Um, Sounds but, good to uh, me. <laughs> yeah, if that makes okay, it made some sense. <laughs> but I think it's not. I don't really... know why we start with the assumption that we're that they're inherently different from us is what I'm saying when we're genetically so closely related. Bad philosophy. Um, a lot of the philosophical influences, like some things I mentioned earlier, um, and then it's a big deal. Like one prime thing is getting the philosophy of science right and getting epistemology right um there's a lot of bad ideas about epistemology in the culture and 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 to some extent 
it makes sense because it's like epistemology and the nature of science is very complex and complicated to get it right. I sure the Mm -hmm. hell wouldn't even know where to start. The only reason I know what I do now is from studying what other people have said about it and studying some history of science. Otherwise, I would be clueless. And I know from my own personal history how it was like 40 years ago versus now. Um, Mm -hmm. And uh, there's um, like it's really difficult to figure out, really complex, but we still have a lot to learn. Um, Yeah, yeah. People are still, because it's so complex, people still have to figure out how exactly science works and what good epistemology is. And we're learning um, mm-hmm. You know, we've made tremendous progress. Um, look at Ptolemy, for example, versus Kepler, um, Copernicus, Newton. Um, you know, Newton, Copernicus, Kepler um, had to not merely function as scientists; they had to function as some philosoph- They had to function as philosophers and epistemologists to figure out mm-hmm. how we know. How do we know this stuff? And that's like Kepler actually titled one of his books, A New Astronomy, based on causes to differentiate it from Ptolemy, which is merely mathematical description. And like some of the ancient Greeks thought that perception, and it's a long story as to why, but they thought perception could not be the root for concepts. But um, Newton and Galileo, they were finding out that no, following Aristotle and developing what not even Aristotle had fully developed yet that um no induct like concepts are based on perception i mean aristotle knew knew that but they figured out things about induction how we generalize that even aristotle hadn't and that's how they were able to get modern science going but um we need to get more lessons from that and see that um science is really based on the evidence of the senses and if you look at the evidence of the senses um animals have emotion and have intelligence. Um, mm-hmm. And it's a big picture view, as you say, with like evolution. It's not like, oh, the evidence of the senses makes it seems like um, the sun's going around the earth. Well, no, because if you look at more evidence of the senses stuff, motion is relative. When things are moving, mm-hmm. A could be moving and B could be still. B could be moving and A could be still. They could both be moving. Copernicus pointed that out. Um, but it's not just like we think animals are consciousness just like we think the sun goes around the earth it's an entirely different situation there's a lot more yeah. very integrated um conceptual set conceptual theory about um animals having intelligence being able to think not conceptually but mm-hmm. they can think they can have emotion um so i think it's like the only valid i don't think it's valid to say they're machines that's such a denial of so much stuff. Um, Yeah. So I think you're like way, way more right beyond what that, that other claim can ever be. Well, I mean, look at your cat. Look at my cat. Look at your cat. It's not a machine. Excuse me. (laughs) Right. Right. Yeah. Anybody who has a close relationship with an animal knows that. Yeah. 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 Were you a history major? Is that your field or degree in math background degree in math and a degree in philosophy? Oh, math and philosophy. Interesting. Oh, how interesting. That's fascinating. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. Um, well, that's neat. That's really cool. But yeah, just this and that led me to study a little history of science. I'd like to do more. Yeah. Always more to do. Very just cool. like, I can't watch your videos enough. I wish I had more time. Some of the stuff you post, I want to watch, but it's like, ugh, pull myself away. I need to do other stuff. Yeah, I could spend all my time on the internet and on YouTube, too. <laughs> it's like point you have to just do the basic things of life but yeah but yeah like you so much to learn you just got to get out there and do your dirt time um yeah exactly just experiencing it and doing it and being it um that's the fundamental as you pointed out earlier it's the important thing yeah yeah i'm like the same yeah but um so you were talking about the black bear and all this stuff anything else you want to add to that like how the things are connected figured out much about the rituals or Let's see. Oh, the, the another thing I learned uh, in um, 
camera trapping bears, I wasn't aware of this through tracking, is that some of these bear marking trees and some scent stations of other species become multi-species scent stations. Hmm. So, you know, um, I had some cameras out in Montana, and I found that a wolf, um, the wolves always walk by the bear tree. One time they stopped and peed on it. Um, a cougar was sniffing it. The local moose and deer would sniff it. So there was, um, I hadn't really been thinking about it or I hadn't been aware or it hadn't occurred to me that there's a lot of interspecies communication going on too, which kind of makes sense because mm-hmm. you need to know, you know, other animals, other species can be dangerous to you or beneficial to you. So the more you're able to kind of uh, be aware of and process their I mean, information, then the more successful you're going to be. So um, that's really, and I would never know that through tracking. Like, you know, say I'm, I'm just, hmm. you know, mm-hmm. working on learning about bear sign. I'd learn how to identify a bear marking tree and a bear um, uh, stomp trail, but I wouldn't know like all the different things that happen there until I put cameras up and see. Yeah, like you might be able to find the, thought, you might be able to find the bear sign on a tree and some moose track nearby. But what did they do? Why was it here? What happened? Yeah, and you, yeah, and the the you know the you only find those tracks there if you happen to be there, like you know, shortly after the end, uh, mm-hmm. the moose or or the wolf came. But you know, if you leave a camera up for a year <laughs> at a certain spot you get to see all of the animals that interact with that with that bear tree or with that bobcat scrape or whatever, whatever scent station you're targeting. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's the same. I learned the fa- same thing with, um, like, a lot of fisher scent marking areas will be scent marked by other animals, too. So there's a lot, a lot of interspecies stuff going on. And we don't really, you know, I, biologists aren't really studying we, that very much. They, they study communication particularly scent communication, but communication in general within a species. Um, but what about what about all the communication that's going on between species? You know, we don't participate so much in that because we now, being such a technological society, we've kind of divorced ourselves from all of that wild stuff, and we kind of live in parallel to it. Most of us do anyway. But they are still, other species are still very much interconnected and use each other for food and, um, and so forth, so, um, or, or get used as food. So they need to be much more attuned to, um, to the other species. And, and, uh, and it does appear, from what I see happening at sense stations, that there is um, a lot of awareness um, between species, hmm. not just within a species. And so it's not like when um, a wolf oversends on a bear, it's trying to compete but maybe it's just saying i'm here also um we have a co-boundary or something like that yeah who knows what they're saying i don't know i mean even for the bear with for the bear marking tree in particular it's not even territorial within the species that's not a territorial Mm -hmm. thing that the bears are doing it's more like a a message board where bears in the area all uh, mark on the same one it's not a territorial thing so who knows what it means for each other species (laughs) you know what i mean yeah why are they marking on it? I don't know. <laughs> That's why I like, for example, there's others, but I like the word at work of uh, Baron Heinrich. He does some of that. Um, oh yeah, yeah. I've read I've read one of his books. Yeah. Yeah, I've read. Yeah. Listened to a lot of his on Audible. It's like. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I um, read his one on the Winter Book last year. Oh yeah, yeah. I've listened to Winter World, Summer World, The Mind of the Raven. Um, a lot of good stuff. Yeah, yeah. And he's—I don't know if you knew, but he's actually. Um, in the still, even though what I think is in his 80s now, he's still in the top 10 in the United States for 50 mile run, 100 mile run, and 24 hour run. Wow! So you, you know, all the books so he does, and he's a world class biologist. But whoa, he's actually like a world class like runner too. <laughs> World class everything. Uh, don't like, tell me he's whoa. an opera singer too. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. <laughs> Probably is. <laughs> but Concert so pianist. Cool. <laughs> or, um, I actually, he was nice enough to be on a podcast one time, and he said that uh, sometimes yeah he'll actually um, hang 
one armed a hundred feet up in a tree, but he doesn't just do it just to, to do it. He does it because that's the only thing he can do to um, look at a bird nest and study some of the, like a bird and get some of the information he needs. Wow. Oh my God. That is <laughs> yeah. amazing. Amazing. Yeah. And he said, I think uh, huh. one thing I read, he was, um, when he was getting his PhD, I think he wrote a paper. He was still a student. Um, I think it was about how the moth um, cools off, the thermoregulation yeah. thing. And he disagreed with the leading authority in the world about that. Yeah. And yeah. his paper was rejected, and it was rejected by that person. So he wrote, um, I mean, can you imagine you're a student? If, if it's rejected, you're probably going to say, well, I'm probably wrong. And da, da, da. you know, a lot of people would be like that. But he actually wrote and demanded it be published and stuff. And they check into it. And sure enough, um, they looked into it and stuff. And it was published. And he was right. Yeah. Wow. So Very impressive. I think yeah. if I get to do life again, I'd want to be him. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> That's a good idea. Wow. I was thinking, hmm, but I don't want to come back as a bobcat, but I want to come back as a fisher. <laughs> no, let's come back as Bear Nyrick. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> True. Amazing. Very impressive. Yeah. yeah. Kind of like uh, hmm. Richard Feynman was pretty impressive, too. Yeah. I actually think Mark Elbrock is really amazing. Have you had him on your podcast yet? No. I'll have to do that, yeah. So many people. You should so get time. him. Cool. Yeah, um, he's a really he's a really amazing person too. Oh, he does more than tracking. Uh, well, he's a mountain lion biologist. Yeah. But uh, cool. Yeah, I mean, I think he kind of epitomizes to me like someone who can who can do all of the necessary aspects for wildlife biology. He's great scientifically. He can handle the the sort of physical outdoor part of it as well as interact um, uh, effectively with the public, because a lot of dealing with large carnivores is human-wildlife conflict and mm -hmm. dealing with people's complaints and so forth. And, and, and he, he seems to be able to manage all of that, cool. nice. which is, I find, extremely impressive. Yeah, true. I think the people part of it would drive me insane. The kind <laughs> of crazy, you know, the kind of crazy beliefs that people have about large carnivores and but he Agreed. he goes with it. He's up for the challenge. It's pretty amazing. Cool. Thanks for the suggestion and reminder. I'll have to Yeah, try get to get him. That. He's great. He also recently published a book on mountain lions, so he's probably going to want to promote it. So cool. he may want to do it. Yeah. Cool. Good. But before we forget about the bears, like uh, what are the different things you say the bears do and they're just like sentences, like words making up? A sentence. Oh, I was just sort of pointing out that, like, I didn't, re I hadn't realized before I saw it on camera how their different scent marking things are all used in connection rather than just isolated. Mm -hmm. I wasn't mm -hmm. thinking that it could be that, you know, maybe things mean different when they're in different combinations or used together as opposed to when they're used separately. Just like we can assemble words. And sentences and to for different meanings you know what i mean mm -hmm. i didn't real. i wasn't thinking of scent marking in that way at all until <laughs> i watched what bears do I and what I, what are the different things that are strung together that they do well so i had i had this um i had these two cameras um in montana one was facing the bear marking tree and another one was facing this a spring where there was a pool of water and they were right, they were literally like I don't know ten or fifteen feet apart, and so with the help of the two cameras, I could see a bear traveling between those two things and doing his scent marking in two different places and using a stomp trail in between them. And then there was also I hadn't realized it, but there was another smaller marking tree also near there. So he had the two trees, the pool, and the stomp trails, and he was just kind of doing this thing going hmm. between them. Um, and that was that was the one bear. Some bears came by and just did one thing or two things. But this bear was making huh. a whole, you know, complex. And I was thinking, well, does that mean something different if they're doing it? You know what I mean? Hmm. Is it just a difference in intensity? I, I kind of think there might be more to it than that because bears are known to be so intelligent um, that maybe maybe it means something different when they um, 
when they do them, you know, group these different kind of scent marking behaviors together. So it'd be the tree, I don't know. the stomping, and the um, water? Yeah, the, he would be in the pool. But bears love to take baths in pools of water, but this one was also like rubbing its head on the bank of the, hmm. the little pool uh, in a similar way that they rub their heads on, on trees. And then there was a second tree in there also, and he was kind of, um, kind of rotating between those things as opposed to just doing one and moving on. Some of the bears would just take a dip in the pool and, and go, and some of them would just rub the tree and go. Um, you know, but this one was kind of making a whole um, a, a, a more elaborate thing out of it. And uh, it just started making me wonder that maybe this is a lot more complicated than we realize. Hmm. Mm-hmm. What do you, you know, and who knows? Is there one thing he'd do first? Would he do the pool and then the tree? Or the tree and well, then the pool? Well, this one, that particular bear went into the pool first. Yeah, that's what he did. And then he uh, rubbed his head on the bank and then stomped to one of the trees, did the whole marking behavior at the tree, stomped to the other tree and did the whole marking behavior there, and then stomped back to the first tree <laughs> and, huh. did, and marked that one, stomped again, and left finally. Huh. Um, but I had never seen it. I just hmm. wouldn't even, you know, I, it wouldn't occur to me that it would be this whole complex thing strung together as just opposed as opposed to just you know uh separate little behaviors where you know what i mean yeah hmm. so made me made me think about you know to just sort of force me to look at, to consider the possibility that there's a more complex level um, of this than than we know hmm. mm-hmm. or maybe that's a bunch of bs i don't know who knows <laughs> i don't know yeah have figured out <laughs> I wonder if that's kind of the case. What do you think it might be in terms of like something a person might do? Um, or would you need more time to think about that? Is that like... Yeah, I'd need more time. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Because yeah. there's something like you might consider going in the door, putting down your keys, taking off your shoes, putting down your briefcase or something like that. Um, a whole sequence of kind of connected things in a certain order you do it in. Um, because the key, putting down the keys and opening the door aren't in isolation. Um, but I don't know. I'm just yeah, I don't know. I don't. I don't know if that's a, right now. Yeah. too great a comparison because those are sort yeah, of utilitarian right. things that you're doing, whereas the scent marking stuff isn't. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. You know, just they thinking, you know, so, no, I'm not saying it's a case. Plus, yeah. it's like yeah. a different kind of purpose. I'm just thinking about yes, it's a different purpose. It's more the each of the different things that the bears do are. Uh, are part of scent communication, so yeah. it probably I don't know. I I I draw the analogy between you know to um, to human language because that's how we communicate mostly is with language, whereas bears are using mm-hmm. scent. Mm-hmm. So that's why I just sort of made that metaphor of you know word <laughs> versus sentence versus paragraph. And, mm-hmm. But who knows? Who knows what they're doing? Yeah. And maybe maybe there's a lot of sense, maybe there's a lot of communication going on that's not really that conscious for them. That's just they just they do it for whatever reason they do it because it did you know they they rub the tree because they're itchy, but it also has um, it also communicates information to other bears without the one that leaves the scent really being conscious that he's leaving that information. We mm-hmm. don't know who knows. I don't know. Yeah, that's one thing that's cool about all this biology. Yeah. Calculus is easy. Biology is complex. <laughs> <laughs> Calculus has has uh, clear answers, right? Specific yeah. answers. Yeah. And it doesn't change or adapt or have a personality. <laughs> or evolve, yeah. It doesn't... <laughs> right. Or yeah. um, it doesn't have to do something new when some new animal comes into your environment or something like that. Yeah, it doesn't have to adapt to environmental change. Yeah, It right. just is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, um, well, let's see. Your phone might be about dying. My brain's been dying. I've been wanting some coffee for the last, like, 40 minutes. Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> well, this, this wouldn't be a bad time to, to wrap up as far as I'm concerned. Cool. Um, anything else you want to... Say to folks about stuff we said so far, certification, tracking, game cams, uh, anything, bears, bobcats. Uh, no, I guess I'm good. If you have any last questions. Uh, Where's um, my coffee? <laughs> oh. <laughs> All right. Well, I can't help you with that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
But cool. Good conversation. A lot more we can talk right, about. Great. Be nice to dig into yeah, bobcats very... more since they're around here or coyotes and stuff. But for the future, um, hopefully we can do this again. But, All right. Sounds great. Thanks so, for having me. Cool. Thank you. And, uh, Appreciate your time. Take care, Mike. Okay. You too. Have a good day. Thanks. Okay. Bye-bye.